one of the best interviews I've ever heard watching sports, the Tour de France transition stage, stage 19, has to have one of these every year, too hilly for the sprinters to control, too easy for there to be any GC action, tired legs in the peloton, and so Wood Phillipson and Alpson just try and get in this breakaway, Campanard's on the attack, Pedersen absolutely flying today, just got unlucky and got a bit isolated, and break formation, it took forever. This was like a classic, like watching a, a February race with Yumbo and UAE also trying to get their rulers, Laporte and Trenton in, Pedersen pulling Lushenko, and there's splits in the first hour with actually UAE's Adam Yates here on the front on the wrong end of that, and UAE having to close that gap. Ineos might not have noticed, and every team wants to be in this break. Every team knows the break will win, so that's why you see Pollitt attacking today when he didn't yesterday, and EF trying to get Bediol in the move. Eventually, Alaphilippe is the man that snaps the elastic, going with Campanarts, Pollitt, Haig, Trentin, Benoit, Pedersen, and this is a really strong breakaway with a lot of the strong teams represented, and we see it getting blocked up. And the, the day's break, it's taken us nearly two hours. We think it's finally gone, but some teams missed it. Israel didn't get in, and they want something out of the stage. You know X and EF want something. And even though this break looks really strong and has a gap of a minute, three full teams working behind meant that that gap just gradually came down and down and down. And with Nils Pollitt, one of the engines of that break, having a mishap, he snapped his chain. So this first bike, I think, is too small for him. And that was what was wrong. And then, and he's on, or maybe he had a look pedals, and he's on Shimano pedals. And so then he says, the next one definitely was the pedals were wrong. And then the third bike, I think, has the right pedals, but because he's 194 centimeters, it's way too small. So he gives up, and he, listen, the brake looked ragged at this point anyway. The gap was a minute. He gets dumped out of that breakaway. That's his day over, and EF are mowing into it with Paulus. And at the intermediate sprint, Alperson, who'd missed the breakaway but also we're suspiciously absent from the front chasing, all of a sudden get into a counter move with Van der Poel and Philipsen up the road, and this huge group goes. The peloton gets blocked up again through this town, and we have a counter move of like 35 riders going across to the original eight, and Benoit's saying to Alphilippe, I'm not pulling anymore. I've got Laporte coming across, you know, our, one of our best classics riders left here, and that's not the peloton. That's the counter move coming across to these guys, and Haig had two teammates coming across. Trenton was isolated, though, and whilst he's arguing with Al Philippe, who had Asgren behind, Campanarts anticipates again and actually gets a fair old gap with EF, who've just spent the last, I don't know, hour chasing. Vanderpool doesn't want to spend his bickies closing it back, so Clark, with four Israel riders in that move, decides the best place to be is actually up front, and Uno you know X can chase, or EF, or another team. And, you know, did Uno you know X need to be the team that chased with Philipson and Laporte in this group and Pidcock? No, they didn't, but they did, and they spent charming on the climb. But by the actual final 2K, 6% climb with 29Ks to go, Asgren just absolutely whacks it with Campanarts, kind of a sitting duck up the road. O'Connor's on his wheel, and Morich knew this was the moment, this was the move to go with the previous stage's winner, an absolute truck, and these three are fully committed, and it's absolute chaos behind, with no one wanting to pull too much with others in their wheel when you see them fanned across the road like this, not enough strong domestiques, like Pedersen doesn't have a teammate, Haig and Alaphilippe and Wright were blocking it up or marking every single move that tried to go, they're on the wheel of, Al of Laporte, they're on the wheel of Betty Ole, or Pedersen right here has got... Haig third wheel and this group's working seamlessly together now with a gap of 30 seconds and that chaos continues behind with Laporte using the descent to go clear but MVDP doesn't relay with him despite the group up the road he plays almost the Philipson card behind but then gets into the other chase groups with Zimmerman, Betty and Cohen by the time there is a chase they're all cooked Asgren stomping, O'Connor's still working because, you know, at worst he gets third on the stage. Morich is fully committed and only in the last 600 metres do we see O'Connor finesse. Morich tighten up the boots. O'Connor throws in the move and this is the only way Morich can win this stage against the better sprinter Asgren is basically O'Connor triggering Asgren 
who has to sprint or start a sprint at 400 and then lead out Morich almost the whole way in the wheel the entire time. And even then, it looked like Asgren, still sprinting out of the saddle with 100 metres to go, didn't have Morich coming around him, but finally he runs out of steam. And it's only with Morich bike throw that he wins his third Tour de France stage. Asgren didn't extend just enough in time. Emotional for Morich, the third stage for Bahrain, victorious out of Asgren, O'Connor, Phillips, and Pedersen, Laporte, Mesh gets Betty Old Trent in Pidcock. Here is that interview that I mentioned at the start. It means a lot because uh, it's just uh, hard and uh, cruel to be a professional cyclist. You suffer a lot in preparations, uh, you sacrifice your life, your family, and uh, you do everything you can to get here ready. And then after a couple of days, you realize that everyone is just so incredibly strong that it's just uh, hard to follow the wheels sometimes, you know. And uh, the other day on Col de la Loz, I was completely tired and empty and done with it. And uh, you know, you have to go all the way to the top and across to the finish line and then do it again next day, you know. And you see the staff who wake up at 6 a.m go for one, one, one hour to, to run and then they finish their work at 11 in the evening or midnight, close the mechanics track because we need to change tires, gears, everything, all, every day, all day, no? and physio and massage and everything. And then sometimes you feel like you don't belong here because you, everyone is so incredibly strong that you, you struggle to hold wheels sometimes. Even today during the day I was thinking the whole day, like how is... And you know that the guy who's pulling is suffering just as much as you do, but it's just cruel to then be able to, to follow the decisive attack when Kasper went, I don't know, like he was so incredibly strong. He went into, on the attack yesterday and won the stage and today to have the will and determination to do it all over again, like you just feel, you just feel that you don't belong here. And then I, I followed him, I knew I have to make everything perfect and I, I tried my best because I, I not just for myself, also for Gino and for, for the team. And then in the end, you almost feel like you betray them because you, you beat them not to, do, to the line. But yeah, it's just uh, the way professional sport is. Everyone wants to win. And uh, obviously, if I want to win, I need to take the wheel of Kasper and, uh, and then try to beat him on the line the last 50 meters. But yeah, I just feel like so many things right now. I know that uh, I don't often win because I'm not as strong as the others, but I can keep the, the cool and uh, the focus in the crucial moments. And when Kasper made that attack on the climb, I was in a lot of pain, pain, but I knew that it was a decisive move and I somehow find the mental strength to follow the wheel, no? And then I just tried to push tempo all the way to the top and uh, stay in the wheels. And uh, I was selfless. I, I also tried to contribute to, to us staying away because if I didn't, we wouldn't stay away. And at one point I felt sorry for Ben because I knew he has no chance in the sprint, but he still pushed to stay away because he also wants to contest the win, even though he knows it's, uh, he's likely to lose, no? But then, yeah, I just... In the closing meters, when, when Ben went, it was the, his only chance, so I knew this and I knew Kasper is going to react because he was by far the strongest and I just followed his will and he basically let me out. I, I don't have a strong sprint, but yeah, after a hard day like this, you never know and I'm just happy for myself, for the team and for everything that happened in the last, uh, in the last month.